things, I cannot produce an image that will be meaningful to you. The magic in me must come from you. Understand how I see the world, and I will be ready to record the magic of your own vision. The ISO number that's printed on the film box is not treated as a wholly unchangeable figure. Galen regularly shoots his film with his camera set to an ISO number that is technically incorrect. For Galen, creative use of ISO is an integral part of personal vision. Galen recommends that photographers perform a simple test with one roll of film. The test will determine what ISO numbers are your personal preference in specific kinds of scenes. To perform the test, take one 36 exposure roll of film and shoot six exposures of six different scenes at six different ISOs. Shoot a variety of subjects, a bright sunlit landscape, a shadowed landscape, a scene with mixed and scattered light, a scene with flesh tones, a scene with clouds, and six of a general open landscape. Galen is shooting ISO 100 speed film. His first exposure is shot with the camera set to ISO 64. The next exposure is made with the camera set to ISO 80. Next, ISO 100, ISO 120, ISO 160, and ISO 200 finally finishes out the scene. Galen shoots a two-stop range of exposures in one-third stop increments. The 36 slides will guide future use of this particular combination of film and equipment. Write down a precise record of each exposure so that you can see which ISO number you prefer in each scene. Now that we have our test roll of Vectorchrome 100 Plus processed, I'm putting it out on the light box in exactly the order that I wrote down the images in my notebook in the field. And as I go through them, I'm finding out that the ISO on the box is not what I necessarily prefer. In the first sunlit scene, I prefer ISO 120. In the shadowy scene, I prefer ISO 100. In the modeled light, ISO 200, because the dark shadows in the center have thrown off the exposure reading. Flesh tones, ISO 120. Bright light cloud, ISO 64, because the whiteness has thrown off my exposure reading. And the general scene, which happens to have the same white cloud in the back, also ISO 64. By looking at this and making an estimate, I would set my exposure meter for this camera and this film and my personal preference at ISO 120, not the speed that's marked on the film box. It's a really valuable test to tune your film and your eye and your camera to exactly what you need. Here in the High Sierra, I often have a chance to photograph Alpenglow. It's a very special kind of mountain light. Alpenglow means a glow on the Alps, and it was seen in Europe as a scarlet color on mountains at sunrise and sunset. The color is so vivid that it's often unbelievable to people who haven't seen it in person. When they see the color in photographs, they say, that's not real. But it is real. And what happens is that the red that you would normally see at sunset down at sea level is caused by light rays coming from the side through a lot of atmosphere instead of straight down the way they do at high noon. And if the light rays came to, say, this point, through a lot of atmosphere at sea level, think of how much redder they would get if they continued that journey out this way to a mountain peak. And when a mountain peak juts above the horizon, it catches light rays that almost skim the horizon over here and have had a full double journey through the atmospheric haze, getting ever redder as they travel. A lot of people, as soon as the sunset's gone, uh, go back to their car, put their camera away, hear lots of clicking. Clicking of tripods closing, clicking of trunks closing, ignition starting, doors closing. 
people drive away. But many times that's when the most wonderful things happen in the sky, 15 or 20 minutes later. Because the Earth's shadow rises. You have a blue shadow in the sky with red above it. And when you get thick parts of the landscape working with that, things that stick up into the landscape, such as Half Dome here, uh, such as profiled cliffs or trees or any number of things, you can get some of the most satisfactory landscape shots well after sunset. Light is everything. If there's no light, you have no photograph. And in landscape photographs, I think in terms of light first. I don't even think of the subject matter first. I think I'm looking for great light, magical light. And when I find it, I run around madly and look for something to put into it. But I don't look for a subject uh, and then say, oh, what's the light like? Well, is it good, bad? Uh, first of all, I think of light. And it looks spectacular to, to your eye, but the only way you can really capture it is to somehow uh, compress the range that your film uh, is recording. And I use a split neutral density filter to do that. One part of it is gray. It doesn't add any color to it. And it holds back the exposure about two stops. And then it gradually gradates into clear. And if I put that line of gradation uh, along the place where the light changes, then I can have a good exposure in the shadows and still not overexpose the highlights. And that's a way that I get around having lighting contrasts that exceed the capabilities of my film. To look at Galen's completed shot, you'd never suspect that a gradated split neutral density filter was used. But without the filter, the huge difference between the bright highlights and dense shadow areas becomes easily visible. Many people bring back pretty pictures that aren't relevant to the place they've been. And to make a photograph about a place that's significant, you should first think about the things that are important in that place. Here we're in Joshua Tree National Monument, and there are beautiful Joshua trees and they're boulders. And the, the photograph that says Joshua Tree National Monument has those two elements in it. Those rocks over there look pretty good, but they're a little sparse on the Joshua trees. But if we get even one or two trees sticking out there, and we have the backdrop of this valley, the light's going to be really different in the valley behind, because it's going to be very blue in the shadows, and we're going to have the real orange light on these rocks at, at sunset. So this is a really good potential. But right now, it's so drab. You just never know what it's going to look like in a few hours. I very rarely find a photograph wholly made. Usually I see one element that I want and then figure out how I'm going to put the rest of the, of the photograph together. I, I see something and I think, it's not so good now, but in different light, that would be good. And if I can put it together with something else, if I can put A and B together, then it'll be good. And I carry that in my mind, go from place to place, until I find those things and then come back in the light that I think is right and make the photograph. And then that way my camera leads me to see more beautiful things than I would see without it because it's training me to follow light and leads me to those beautiful spots. This is looking like it could be really good. Isolated tree and the, the rocks are really well separated, but the light is really flat. But it's going to get the last sunset. It, the, when the sun's right down on the horizon, it's going to get fabulous light and the angle is just right to get that tree and the rocks with a real alpenglow. This is going to be beautiful at sunset. We should come back. When I've been traveling, I've seen a lot of beautiful sunrises and sunsets, but I don't photograph them directly. I use them as a tool, a source of light to make other things beautiful.
whenever I travel, I take a large amount of equipment with me. But then when I go in the field, I tailor what I'm going to take to my needs. And I may take only one camera body and one or two lenses at most. If I see wildlife, I'll take my 400 millimeter lens and maybe my 180. If I'm going out after a landscape where I know I have a foreground, I might take just my 20 millimeter and my 24 millimeter and just those two. And if I'm going out for a day or so and traveling light, I take a 24 millimeter, a 55, and a 75 to 150 zoom. The trick of getting good landscape photographs is to find something that you can emphasize so that when your viewer looks at the photograph, he recreates what was important to you. And to do that, I don't want to use a normal lens most of the time. I want to use a wide angle to emphasize the breadth of something or the telephoto to pull something in. And wide angles are my favorite because I can do a lot of different things with them. I can turn them down a little bit and have just a kiss of horizon in the far distance and have the whole stretch from two feet in front of my camera out to infinity. Now that looks good over there. If I use a polarizer, I can really saturate those colors. A polarizer cuts most of the reflected light from the sky. So it cuts that extra blueness that you get from the sky, darkens the sky to separate the sky from the land, and intensifies colors by taking away that blue pollution that comes from the big blue umbrella that's over your landscape. A polarizer is only effective where you have a direct light source. If you can't see the sun, then you're not going to have the major effect that a polarizer has. And you have to use it close to 90 degrees off axis from the sun. If you use it in line with the sun, either toward the sun or away from the sun, then it does nothing because the sun is in that same plane. Color saturation isn't something that pops out at your eye and looks great on film. You've got to work at it. Normal approach to taking pictures of flowers would be to have the sun behind you and take a head-on shot. But there's several things I can do here to make these colors really pop. If I come around 90 degrees, then I start to pick up shadows. And those shadows are going to make the colors look richer because any color against a darker color looks brighter than it does against a lighter color. Also at this angle, a polarizer is going to work for me. And that's going to give me richer colors because it'll cut the blue from the sky and cut the surface reflections from the stalks of grass and the flowers. And I'm going to give it a little bit of underexposure. That too is going to darken the adjoining colors and make things look richer. Boy, does that look bright. When I want